So, Dave, we're going somewhere. Where are we going, Elaine? The journey to fearless. I didn't hear what she said. <laughs> I see, though. I see what she did. The journey to fearless. Fear is among the um, malignant, malignant uh, effects of sin. And when I say one of the initial, I'm actually being quite conservative because other than the spirit of pride itself, which, uh, which opened man up to eating of the fruit that God said don't eat, and for the reasons that they opened up, which was, you know, you'll be wise like God and you'll be able to make your own choices about what right and wrong is. That was the initial one. But the subsequent and immediately subsequent malignant effect of sin was fear, which shows that it has a tremendous assignment in our lives from our enemy. If faith is truly the substance of things hoped for, and it is, then fear is certainly that which substantiates what we dread. If faith gives substance to what we expect and desire, then fear gives substance to what we dread. And so it has a specific assignment, and it's very subtle. Nobody really ever wants to claim to be afraid. And fear cloaks itself in things other than terror and fright. You know, we used to play games when we were little all the time. Friends, cousins, being Pastor Trice used to play games. And fear was a part of it. You know, and I guess in those cases, fear can be funny. But there's a side of fear that, that is so diabolical, and I mean literally diabolical. Fear is the spawn of Satan, and it has an assignment in your life. And what I'm attempting to do by the grace of God to take us on is a journey to fearless. Give me Psalms 56. Uh, yeah. To the chief musician set to the silent dove in distant lands, a meekdom of David when the Philistines captured him in Gath. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. <clears throat> My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. <laughs> Keep coming to lane. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. <clears throat> I will not be afraid. I will not fear. What can man do to me? All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps and lie and wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger, cast down the peoples, O oh God. You number my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. <clears throat> in God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do unto me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? <laughs> Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me for my soul. Trust in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. God bless the reading of his word. <clears throat> the cause of fear is the threat of harm, whether real or perceived, 
physical or emotional. <clears throat> In that sense, the threat of harm doesn't necessarily mean bodily harm. It doesn't necessarily be the destruction of something. Harm can be lost. Sometimes we fear loss. Sometimes we fear that we won't attain to something. In the garden, what the, the serpent said to Eve was, God's keeping something back from you. There's something he don't want you to know. He told you you had everything, but there's something else that you don't have. And so suddenly there's this empty space inside of her where she was full, and that fear is causing her to move in a direction that she should not. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the cause of fear is the threat or the dread of harm or loss, whether real or perceived, whether physical, emotional. And the problem <clears throat> with the presence of fear is that fear will counsel your decisions. Fear is a cruel counselor because its intent for you is not good at all. But fear will actually say things to you to give you comfort in a direction that you should not go in. Fear is just set up to bring you harm. And so he will counsel your decisions and get you to do things that God never intended to get you to do. Fear is in control when you dread or and or procrastinate critical matters that desperately need an outcome that you must but yet cannot seem to provide. It's the dread or the procrastination of critical matters that have to be addressed, but you can't seem to do anything about it. That's the nesting place for fear. Something comes to your mind, and you know that thing needs a solution, and you know you're the one that's supposed to provide the solution, and no matter how many times you've thought about it, no matter how many times you've pursued it, but no matter how many times you've prayed about it, you still don't seem to have an answer, and suddenly, rather than going after the thing, you find yourself just standing still somewhere, trying not to think about it. Everybody has those things in their lives that when your mind goes to that place, it brings nothing but pain. And then you have to flee and go somewhere else. Initially, fear uses its predictions to stop you. It'll tell you how things are going to be. It'll tell you what's going to happen if you keep on or if you ever try to. Or you, when you get out there doing that, you're going to look like or this is what they're going to say because you, all of these things, it's a conversation and it, and it gives you these predictions of what will happen. But fear's ultimate goal is not to rule you with predictions, it's to rule you with sensations so that he not only, he no longer has to have the conversation with you, just the mere thought of that thing sends a shockwave through your system and you run away and hide. All he's got to do is alert you to his presence. All you got to do is say how terrible, not with words, but with that sensation inside. And you have to go somewhere else and find something else to think about. Fear is trying to control you. And fear's ultimate goal is not to scare you. That's just the means. Fear's ultimate goal is to control you. The reason fear comes, now trust me. <clears throat> The devil is so foul that, yes, he gets joy out of seeing us somewhere in this dreadful place and our hearts twisted, but that's not his goal. His goal is what comes next. It's because God has a plan for your life and fear. What you need to understand about fear, I'll come to that in a moment. Fear has a goal for your life, and if he can get you in that place and get you to seize up when he's around, he can keep you from what lies next for your life in God. Fear is trying to get you to respond to him instead of God. Fear is trying to become your God when things are on the line. I want you to discard the power that you have. And so we find ourselves, and you hear me saying we, don't you? We find ourselves making excuses and, and procrastinating <clears throat> and rationalizing and reasoning ourselves into and out of things that fear. Why do I keep assigning a personal pronoun and volition to fear? Because fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. It's not an ethereal force floating through the land that we walk in and out of as a part of our human experience. And that's just like that. And that's the way it is. No, fear is a deliberating, thinking, planning, scheming, desiring uh, uh, spirit, entity, personality sent from Satan, assigned to our lives to keep us out of God's best and to get us into the devil's worst. <clears throat> 
You can't think of fear as just some emotional response. We can't think of fear as, as something that you just own as an inevitable part of your human experience. Because if you accept it as a part of your life, you will build your life around its attacks. And you'll find yourself doing things and saying things and not saying things and spend life avoiding the pain that fear inflicts and celebrate that as a victory. A good day, a peaceful day is one where I didn't have to face or deal with my fears. Who wants to live like that? That's not what God intended for us, y'all. Some people say, I ain't as scared of nothing. No, you just express fear differently than the next person. <clears throat> you are imprisoned to your fears until you overcome them. So that's where we're going today. So what does fear look like? It depends on who's afraid and the situation they face. Because fear can look different in everybody. <clears throat> there, there's, 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 no, there's, no there's, there's no template to fear. Because depending on your experiences and, and your makeup, you might respond to different fears in different ways and different entirely than the person that's next to you. So fear can hide in everyone because everyone, it, 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 it responds differently. So there's three, three primary groups of responses that, 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 that fear elicits in our lives. One of them is to freeze. The other one is flight, flee. The other one is fight. People will respond to fear <clears throat> either by freezing, by running, or by attacking. You might fall into either one of those categories. Say I'm walking down the street here and a, and a, and a Rottweiler uh, uh, comes seizing out of my neighbor's yard, jumps the fence, <clears throat> and is charging me like a bull. I'm going to do one of three things. Some people will freeze and just stand there. And now we might criticize somebody that freezes, but that is a legitimate response to fear. It, it, the animal kingdom, including mankind, does that. Why? Because if, if, if you've got a gazelle that's in the, in the forest somewhere, uh, in the jungle, and, and he sees a predator walking by, the first thing he's going to do is stand still so that perhaps the predator, predator won't see him. Or even if that dog is charging me, maybe if I, seem, I stand still and don't seem like I'm a threat, he won't bite me. I remember, I remember uh, back, back when I was in, in Jackson growing up at Faith Temple, we would have these uh, you know, church picnics and we'd go into these woody areas. And I was a teenager at this point in my life, uh, late teens, and we played hide and seek. But it was almost like grown folk hide and seek. It wasn't kids. We, we were. And so uh, we, everybody dispersed, but there would be teams of people hiding looking for, or searching, looking for people that hid. So I got away from that. I would do my count. They did their count. I'm trying to find the place where I can hide. <clears throat> and so what happened was I took too long, and I saw people coming down the path in the spot where I was just getting ready to hide. It was down in, a, in this little hole up under some trees and shrubs, and they were, I promise you, from me to that speaker, they were like 15 feet away, and they were talking, and I could hear them talking about finding me. I didn't have time to move because had I moved, they'd have seen me. So I just, I did like this. I became a tree. <laughs> and as God is my witness, I became a tree. My foot was sitting in the path that they went just like this, talking about me, and went back around here, around the corner. Then I went and found my place to hide. Wow. Freezing is a legitimate way of, you know, but, but the, the fact is it's, it's still a response to fear. Uh, flight. So say that dog comes out of the backyard and I see him coming and I just I feel like I can outrun him. He got four legs, I got two, but I'm, I'm figuring I can outrun him. I, I ran from dogs all my childhood, y'all. I lived in a neighborhood where we had a bunch of stray dogs and we had this next door neighbor and she just loved dogs, but she would bring these stray dogs in not knowing what their temperament was like. I jumped, I ran for my life, I jumped over fences, I jumped over cars, I ran up the side of buildings getting away from dogs. Flight. Problem is, with a, pre a dog that's by nature a predator, he's going to pursue you wherever you go. So some people might consider fright to be a uh, freeze to be a cowardice way to do the problem and running as well. So I'm a fighter. I, I see the dog come and I'm going to run at the dog just like I'm a bigger dog. <laughs> Maybe he'll back down. Maybe he won't. Maybe you take a few licks, you know, before you get. But the fact is, here's, here's my point in all this. Here's the issue. 
None of these things is better than the other when dealing with fear because all of them are a response to the fear. What God is trying to get us out of is responding to fear. It's letting fear make me do anything. It's not letting fear stop me in my tracks when God is saying move. It's not me turning around and running when God is saying either stand still or advance. Neither is me, me charging an enemy and at this time God wants me to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What God wants to erase from all of us is responding to fear because we cannot afford to use an emotional response to a spiritual attack. It never works. It never works. Your emotional world, the things that linger around in your soul, will never stand up to the onslaught of an enemy that is formidable and designed something to plague our lives like this. So, one of the reasons fear, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the, the praise the Lord part in a minute. One of fear's, one of fear's uh, tactics and strengths is right here. In the, give me a 56, 5, and 6. Fear is very, the spirit of fear, the spirit of fear is very good at recon, reconnaissance. Uh, a, 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 a military strategy and team who sent in to survey the land and find the places of advantage or disadvantage for them. Okay, I'll be strong here. The enemy will be weak there. So if I position myself right here, he'll come there and we got him. He won't even know what hit him. Reconnaissance. Give me 56 and 6 there, uh, Elaine, or 5. All day, this is reconnaissance. All day, you, you can, now our enemies, the Bible says the weapons of, the Bible says uh, we rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities power, power, rule the darkness of this world, spiritual rigors and heavenly places. Our enemies, if you read through Psalm 56, and put the devil in all them spots or fear in all those spots, you come out seeing this the way God wants you to do. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. Keep going. They gather together. They hide. This is the spirit of fear. They mark my steps. Okay, what's he going to do? Okay, I, okay his, his tendency is to, when they lie and wait for my life, he's trying to figure out. The, the spirit of fear is a familiar spirit. Because he's been with you all your life figuring out how you handle things and where you take steps and what you charge. So what the, what the devil will do is when God wants you to stand still, set up something that triggers your fear to charge and make you run right past your blessing. Yeah. Fear's research of your actions and words and lives and assets and liabilities and strengths and weaknesses devises a plan. I want to get this through to you. Fear is not just a feeling you have inside. It is a diabolical personality that has a plan. Just like God has a plan for you to be blessed, fear has a plan to make sure you never are. Yeah. And nothing is off limits. Absolutely nothing is off limits. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's some obvious things <coughs> that fear would use you know, to, to, to scare you out of things. You know, the fear of rejection, the fear of dark on the other side thing, uh, the fear of, uh, of failure. Some people fear success because they don't think it'll last and they end up in failure, so they do things that don't allow them to succeed. All those are obvious things. But fear will even use your religion against you or, or, or your good intention. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I, I, go, I go all the way. I go all the way with everybody, and, and I, I never give up on somebody. I, and that sounds so noble. I never give up on anybody. What about the time in your life when their assignment in your life is over? And you're no longer supposed to be leaking your provision in a branch that won't grow. How about the case where God never assigned them to be in your life to begin with, but your heart is so open and compassionate and loving that you end up and, and you're afraid to offend that virtue. I'm a compassionate person. How can I? And you fear offending that virtue and fear will use a virtue against you. I'm a loyal person. I, I could, this list could go on and a bunch of stuff I'm probably saying applies to me. Listen, there are t you cannot afford to respond to fear. You cannot afford to respond to fear. You cannot afford to pick up your Bible, read a verse and, and, and respond to fear. Because nothing's off limits. 
The devil will use everything. That's why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. How many thoughts? Every thought. The good thoughts? Every thought. The bad thoughts? Anything that assigns itself against the plan of God for your life that you're responding to in fear, God wants you to bring that thing down. Fear has won. Fear has won when you feel like you have no choice. The areas of your life where you feel boxed in, that's fear. I have to do this. I ha- I'm talking, I'm, you understand? I'm not talking about loving your family or preaching the gospel of God compelled you to do that. But I'm, I, you, you, you have decisions, choices to make, and all of a sudden you seem somewhere and you just you feel like something has to be done. And you know what's happening right now is the wrong thing to be done, but you feel like you have no choice. That's fear. That's fear. That's fear. And, and, and fear so pervades our experience that it, 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 it's deceptive because a lot of times the tragedy is many times the things that we are afraid of. It's not something that God is even thinking about. God's not thinking about that thing like you are. Remember in the garden when man took of the, the, the forbidden fruit and God came in the cool of the day like he did every day? <clears throat> he said, Adam, where are you? Adam said, I hid myself because I was a naked and I was afraid. He said, I was afraid because I was naked. His fear is that he was naked. What did God say to him? Who told you you were naked? Who had that conversation? I was never even going to bring that up. That wasn't an issue with me. That, that matter already has a proven outcome. I come down here every, you think you just got naked? I come down here every day and see you naked. Have I ever brought it up? Have I ever said that was an issue? Have I ever focused on that? What did I do? I fellowship with you in the cool of the day. I taught you things. If the time ever came where I didn't want you to be naked no more, I wouldn't scare you putting something on. I'd show you how to make some clothes. Sometimes we have fear about things that God is not thinking about the way that we are. If it scares you and draws you away from him or his promise, that ain't God. That's fear. Yeah. Fear creates problems where there are none. Just, it just, it's, it's, it's an illusion. It's, 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 it's. It's, it's the devil's prediction in the face of God's power. Which of those is going to come out on top? Let's move on. So, uh, so what does trust look like? Put that back up there, Elaine, 56, 1, 2. What does trust look like? Again, to the chief musician set up, set to a silent dove in distant lands, a mictum of David, when, he, when the Philistines captured him in Gath. Be merciful unto me, O God, for a man would swallow me up, fighting me daily, he uh, uh, oppresses me. My, yeah, oppresses me, good. Thank you. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they, they'd be many that fight against me, O most high. Next verse, give me three, give me three. What time I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now, this, notice here what it said that David, what happened to David, and this shows up in 1 Samuel 21. This is the only time in Scripture you see David expressing his fear. And this is actually, even that caption, many translations look at that caption, a, 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 a Psalm of David, as verse 1. Because it really is. All of this was on his scroll when he wrote it and delivered it uh, to, to his, his worship team. Because he was giving context for what happened. And it's in 1 Samuel 21. And the Bible says that the, uh, David ran from Saul into the land of the Philistines. And when he got there, they, they captured him. They took him. And the Bible says he overheard them saying, isn't this David the one that they sang about? Uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands? 
David re immediately realized he made a grave mistake. He was, fear drove him that he was not supposed to run into the hands of the Philistines. Why? Let's just take some notes here. First of all, David is the one that stood up to their champion, Goliath. A boy came out there, and while this man had God cursing God in his mouth, threw a rock at him and killed him, took his sword and cut his head off and held it up in victory like this and took it back to the king of Israel, who, by the way, was too scared to fight, took this man's head in there and put it down. And then what that did was incited this courageous courage throughout the camp of the Israelites, and they chased all them Philistines back home. This is that David. Not only that, but where he came to was Goliath's hometown. <laughs> Not only that, that once David did get into Saul's palace, he got in there, Saul decided, I'm going to trip him up by having him marry my daughter, and I'm going to have her keep an eye on him and, and help him set him up for death. And he had all these plans for his, his daughter and David. They came to David and said, Saul's daughter's available. He said, are you out of your mind? He said, man, I'm a shepherd. I don't have the nerve enough to walk up and ask this man for his daughter's life. That didn't work. So Saul said, go back and tell him what I want. He knew David liked to fight. He said, go back and tell him, all I need is 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And, and, and that's the one. Dave, they came back to David and said, you can actually earn her. He said, He's okay. If you're telling me I can work for something and deserve it, he said, I'll do that. David went out with his little crew and they broke through the garrison of the, 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 the Philistines. And he didn't bring back a hundred foreskins. He brought back 200. <laughs> this is that David who came to those people. He's in a situation now where freeze won't work, where flight won't work, where fight won't work. So what do you do when it's like that? He said, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. I can't run from this. I can't make this disappear. I can't fight this. I'm afraid, God, I put myself in your care. It doesn't matter where you are or how you got there. David got himself in this jam. Yeah, God, I made the mistake. Yeah, God, I thought too much of myself. Yeah, God, I was trusting. I figured I could, I could swag my enemies into liking me. I did everything wrong, but I'm afraid. And whenever I'm afraid, what I do is trust you. No matter how you got there. No matter what's going on. No matter how big the enemy. No matter if it's a mental enemy. It does not matter. Whenever you are afraid, trust is the only response. Yeah. yeah. So, how do you become fearless? Here's the, here's the journey to fearless. Three times in this passage, trust is cited at, at the remedy for fear. We read it in the fourth verse. He said, in God, I will praise his word, his promise. In God, I'll keep my eye on his promise. Everything he said, that's, that would be my reliance. He said, I will not fear. I will trust him instead. Eleven says essentially the same thing. In God, I put my word, in his word. In God, I praise his word. He said, I will not fear. I'll trust in God. Those two seem to imply the condition of fearlessness. He said, I won't do it. I won't do it. And, and, and actually, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, it shows this progression of activities. It's not a completed activity. It's a lifelong journey of being fearless like that as a result of trusting in God. So those two imply the destination of fearlessness. But the first one that we read in the, thir in the third verse actually implies the journey there. Whenever I am afraid, it's admitting that I do get afraid. <clears throat> There are times when something comes upon my life that I can't deal with by myself and the answer seems elusive. So when it gets like that and I'm afraid, I'm going to trust in you, God. I'm going to trust in you. Yeah. So this word trust here means confident. Uh, let me say this. The element of trust you look at the, the, the subject of faith in Scripture, and, and then th th this other word is introduced, like in this case right here, which is trust. 
Trust has a more intimate component with it. It implies a nearness to the source of strength. A, 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 a leaning on, a total leaning on and support of uh, having contact with the source of strength. Trust implies that I come and grab and I hang on to you for dear life. And I'm not going to let you go because I know you know what to do. You know how to handle this. And so trust, the, the literal definition is confident. But we got to look at confident a little bit differently. Confident or confident. Trust is confidence, but that trust does not end up in confidence unless I experience confidence, unless I confide in God. I can't just take some topical verse of scripture and, and, and quote it real big and say, I am the blah, 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 and I will, and blah, 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 because that thing is going to be challenged. And then your declaration is going to need a deeper level of intimacy than that, where you have a conversation with God and you confide in him that I tried to fight that fight, God. And right now, I'm telling you what, the devil gave me a big one and I'm laying on the ground scared right now. I need to talk to you. I need confidence, but my confidence won't come until I confide in you. These are deep, rich, unabridged, unedited conversations that you have with God. When you say, tell it like your T.I. is. God, I'm, I'm not making no confessions today. I'm not quoting my power scriptures. I'm confiding in you. I'm saying something to you that I don't dare say to another living human being. And you confide in God. Hiding our true heart's conditions from God is not an act of faith. Exposing it is. Bring your heart to God just like it is. Trust God with your most vulnerable self. Say things to God that you can't say to anybody else because they, they, they wouldn't be able to handle it. You have to do that. What does that do? It exposes your heart. It opens you up. It, it allows God to get to places that you've been hiding from him. It allows him to touch you in the sore spots and you expand on the inside and where you were responding to fear, you start responding to the presence of God. The presence of fear is waning and the presence of God is growing just by you talking to him. This psalm is a perfect example of that along with many others in the book of Psalms. God, how long will you hide from me? How long will you? to forsake me forever? How long are you going to keep letting my enemies treat me like this? Didn't I do what you said do? He get to the end of that psalm and without anything else happening other than him confiding in God he says but you know what you've been good now that I think about it now that I think about it you've dealt bountifully with me you exactly what I need. Just five minutes ago, he hollered at God. And just from opening up his heart, all of a sudden, everything starts looking different. You need to get in your car and go for a drive. Make sure ain't nobody in the back seat. Go out there way in a field. Go stand in the middle of a parking lot and ain't nobody around. Go over here to Sparrow. Go all the way up to that top uh, parking lot level. Look around and say it like it is. Confide in God. Confidence in God is not possible until you confide in God. So who do I confide in? Who do we confide in? What kind of people? And why do we confide in them? I confide in someone because I, first of all, I know that, that it was always remain confidential. When I confide in someone that I can trust, it is always confidential. What I said to them stays with them what I said with them because here's the point here's the point why did I why do I confide in someone because the load is too heavy on me and it's starting to affect my thoughts and my work and my decision and everything so I find somebody that I can trust and I and, I, and, and they help lift the load off of me so that I'm not alone anymore Nothing's necessarily had to, the problem hasn't changed yet, but I feel differently about it because somebody is in this with me and they're carrying the low with me. And now things are possible that weren't just a minute ago. I can feel it. I can just tell inside something happened. Second reason I confide in somebody is that they always intend me good. 
I know when I tell this person, what I say to them is not going to make them wig out and they brain, again, they got their brain blowing uh, 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 emoji where somebody's brain got blown. These, these people, it does look like, they look like, look, you can't shock me, you can't disappoint me, you can't run me off. I'm here for your best self and your worst self, and I love both of them. Whoever you are, and the day that you come to me, I'm right there with that person. I always intend you good, and don't you ever forget it. If things are good, I'm going to celebrate with you. If things are bad, I'm going to cry with you, and then I'm going to try to do something to help you wipe your tears. Sound like God, don't it? Third reason is that they will always be with you, and they are enough. You don't, you, you, you don't confide in somebody who's here today and gone tomorrow. They've been on your journey for so long, they've proven that they want to be where you are, and you tell them what's on your heart, because when you tell them, and when they're with you, it does something that nobody else can do anymore. For some reason, this relationship right now is enough for me to see my better self and to get up from where I am and move on. I, I had an experience, y'all. I had an experience um, some, some months back. And, and God has had me on this journey here for, for about a year or so. Uh, and, 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 uh, and something monumental happened about halfway through that point. I was, I was laying in bed, and my wife was next to me. And I was laying there, like men do, like women do too, but I'm not my so talking about We have these things that we're responsible for. We have uh, provision that we want to bring and, and trying to find a way to it. We have relationship things that we're trying to, we're trying to see through the way through our kids. All, it's like all of this stuff, both spiritual and natural inadequacies all came on me at once. And I've, I've never felt like that. And I was laying there in bed next door. She's very sensitive. She's sensitive to my presence. She's also sensitive to my absence. So the minute I move, she's like, hey, hey, everything okay? And so I, I couldn't move. I said, I, I can't move. And, and I couldn't pray out loud because she's sensitive to that too. If I start praying, I don't care. It may not be any sound coming out of my voice. Just my mouth moving like that. And she'll either break out in tongues or say, baby, is everything okay? Do I need to pray with you? And so I couldn't do nothing. <laughs> I, love, I love you just the way you are. <laughs> so I had a conversation with God that I didn't know I could have with God in a way that I know I could have it with God. I told him, I said, God, I've got to say these things to you. I can't run from these fears any longer. I I, there's nowhere to hide. I said, and I, I can't wake my wife up either. I said, so I was laying there heart beating. I said, God, I need you to do something for me. I didn't listen to y'all. And it, it's, it's the journey to fearless that led me to this place. I said, God, I need you to do something that I've never asked you to do before. I said, I have some things I want to say to you, but I don't want my enemy to hear them. I need to speak some things. I said, I need you to keep my wife asleep. And I said, and I don't want the enemy to hear yours in my conversation. I said, so do this for me, God. I said, I want you to raise up a barrier between me and my enemy so I can have this private conversation with you. Because I got to say this stuff to you. And as sure as you live, as God is my witness, I tangibly felt a warm, a, a, it's like a warm wall of love that came up over my physical body and closed at the top. And I knew I was completely shielded from any malignant force from the devil, from anything, anybody else, I suddenly knew that I could say anything I wanted to to God. And I said it all. And the devil didn't hear. To this day, he don't know what I said. And mad about it. I said, God, I didn't know I could ask you to do that. I knew you would do that for me. That whole day and the next, I walked around in this bubble of protective love from the presence of God that was willing to shield me and have a conversation with me that I could confide in him. And I tell you, as God is my witness again, from that day to this, the things that I prayed about are either completely worked out or being worked out as we speak. And I can see it happening every day. 
And every time, when I, whenever I'm in moments where something starts to hit my heart, that seems like it's not about to work out, I say it under my breath or out loud. Ask any people that have heard me saying, I trust you, Lord. I trust you. Why? Because that's a place now. Those aren't just words. It's a place and a space that belongs to me and God. So when I say I trust you, I'm transported to that place again. And I, I, I know everything's going to be all right. See, when you trust God, strange and extraordinary things happen. It might not happen the way that you might have thought it would have happened. David went down there and got caught up with people that hated his guts. They wanted to take him back to Philistia and they wanted to make a show out of him. And he couldn't freeze, he couldn't run, he couldn't fight. And he went inside. If you read this along with the, 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 the context, the narrative, you see, based on the timeline, that he went inside and he began to trust God because that's the only recourse that he had. And what did God tell him to do? Look for the sword. No. Look for the helmet. No. Look for, he said, David, David, I'm going to need you to act like you done lost your mind right now. <laughs> Satan law rebuke you. No, it's me. I need you to act like you lost your mind. And this is happening right there. They don't even know it. This is all that's happening inside of David. I trust you, God. If you trust me, do what I'm telling you to do. It may not seem like it's going to work, but I, 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 I got this one. And David says, just let something run down the side of your beard. And David said, he starts spitting in his beard and looking like a madman. And that was God's answer in that situation. When you trust God, miraculous things will happen that you didn't expect to happen or to happen that way. What time I'm afraid, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust you. You can't box yourself in. When you seem like you don't have a choice, then that's fear right there. That's fear. Don't go to that. Because when you trust God, what you realize is that you know more than you've ever learned. You are more powerful than your greatest victory. And you have access to more than you know exists. Uh, yeah. See, the shame of not trusting God, the tragedy of not trusting God is that God remains faithful even when you don't. The answer is right there available within arm's reach. And you could have had it God's way. Give me Romans 3, uh, 3 and 4 up there. I, I, I hope I put this in the, in the, in the notes. If it didn't, I'll, I'll quote it. Okay. Give me three. Give me three, please. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid that God be true in every man a liar. As it is written that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings and that thou may overcome when thou art judged. Let me tell you what the Greek ear heard when, when, when Paul wrote this. What if see, peep, some people don't believe God? Shall their unbelief change the faithfulness of God? No way. Because when God speaks, is what he's saying is true, and every circumstance and person that speaks to the contrary is a lie. As it is written, everything you say happens just the way you said it. And when your works are scrutinized, you're always found to be impeccable and powerful. It's a shame to not believe God because it could be just like he said. All right, y'all. I'm just, I'm not even going to turn to the scripture. I'm just going to say this here. First John. 4 and 18 says there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And just above that text, he was dealing with having boldness in the day of the judgment. Because as Jesus is in this world in, 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 with his father, we're that way here. Here he said fear has torment. We've talked about the torment of fear throughout this message. I don't need to rehash that. But this torment was even tied into man's greatest fear of all. And that is the judgment. As Christians, all my life we were taught to be terrified of the judgment of God. Man, when you stand before God, 
You better have everything exactly how he said he had it, or you about to get tore up for all of eternity in a flaming, burning hell. And, 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 and they, they had us trembling as kids and crying and stuff like that. A lot of times when they get us in them circles, our youth leaders, which was uh, Pastor Larry Mitchell Trice Sr., uh, uh, Pastor Angeline Trice, and my mother, they, they, you know, they, we, they would look for us to pray. And when, they, when you're praying, they wanted you to have get a touch. They wanted you to be broke up and have me get in a touch. And so sometimes the way me and Pastor Trice would come up with a touch is we think about hell and not going. And we be, and then I look, the Lord is touching them. The Lord is using you, son. I'm thinking about flames. But what Paul here is actually dealing with is even our greatest fear. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have come into the unconditional love of God and his love is a perfect love and you don't have a reason to fear even in the day of judgment. All right, I'm finished. The meditation of the fearless. I want you to say this after me. There is no fear nor dread in love. So there will be no fear nor dread in me. That's because perfect love is in me. Your, I am born from perfect love. Your perfect love casts out all my fear. Therefore, I will do nothing because of fear. And I will refrain from nothing because of fear. I will do what I do because of your love. Jesus, your love sustains me and is the cause of my courage. And whenever I am afraid, whenever I am afraid, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Thank you, Father, for your love that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And that totally encapsulates us and shields us from our enemy and his plan for our lives. I declare, God, that everyone in this room and everybody listening is on the journey to fearless. And that the things that have plagued them and their generations are going to fall off and melt like fire on a cobweb. They will walk out of fear and into trust, out of fear and into faith, out of defeat and into victory in the name of Jesus. Guide us on a journey every day, every day, every day, God, throughout the day, speaking the words. I will trust you. I trust you. God. I trust you with this right here. This is a different situation than that. I trust you here. I thank you. Listen, you may be out there, either in this room or there online. God bless you. I hope after hearing the word today, God spoke to you at some point in it. The Bible lets us know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're a believer today, I know that you're going to take that word in your life and you're going to grow and it's going to take you to the next place in God. But maybe you're listening today and you're not a believer. And I want to give you an opportunity to know Jesus Christ. Listen, it is the best life and it's the best thing that has ever happened to me. And if you ask any born again believer, they will say the very same thing. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's you, that's me, believe it in him. You don't have to perish, but you can have everlasting life. Right now, the word is near you, nigh you. The Bible says, and that we simply have to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and we can be saved. It is what the heart man believes. It is what the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Why don't you pray with me? Why don't you give God an opportunity to be Lord and Savior of your life? Let's pray. Come on, say, Lord Jesus, I believe you went to the cross. You died for me. You rose again just for me. And I thank you. I receive you as the Lord and Savior of my life. 
Well, if you believe that, it is that easy. If you believe that, it is that easy. It is getting into the Word and knowing more about what God wants from you every single day. No, you're not going to be perfect. No, you won't get it right all every day. But it is by grace are we saved and that none of ourselves. It is the gift of God. So we recognize that God's grace makes up the difference. Wherever we fail, His grace makes up the difference. Now, maybe you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm already saved, but I just need to get my life back again. I need to get back in church. I need to get back my relationship with Christ. I need to get back to reading the Bible again. I found myself stumbling and falling and going back into the way that I used to go. Listen, um, 1 John 1 and 9 says this, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So listen, I want you to say this prayer. Simply say this, Father, I want you to forgive me for the sins that I've committed. You are my father and I'm coming back to you. It is that simply, it is that simple. Just confessing your sins back to the father puts you in right standing with God. Now maybe also there's another subsequent opportunity, uh, opportunity after salvation experience that is, and that is the being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible lets us know in Acts 2 and 4 that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He wants to baptize you with that will give you boldness. It's more than speaking in tongues. Yes, you will speak with other tongues, but it's more than that. You have boldness. The Holy Spirit will teach you. He will lead you. He will guide you. Man, there's revelation that will come to you. There's some when you don't know how to pray. The Bible says in Romans on the eighth chapter that we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit make it intercessions. Listen, when you don't know what to say, when you don't know what's wrong, it is praying in the Spirit that allows the Holy Spirit to speak to God for whatever it is that you need. Listen, you can, be, you can receive the Spirit right now. It just takes your belief. Listen, the Holy Spirit is going to give you a language if you lift your hands and have the boldness to open your mouth up and just begin to speak it. At the count of three, I'm going to pray. And at the count of three, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this born again believer. I thank you, God, for their faith to believe that there is something more that you have for them. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you reveal yourself to them. Give them your language. Give them the prayer language that they need. Speak to them right now. Fill them, Father, with your spirit so they'll now be up under the influence of you and not under the influence of themselves. At the count of three, I'm going to count, and when I hit three, just begin to open your mouth up and begin to speak as the spirit gives you utterance. One, two, three. Come on, speak. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, every day, pray in the Spirit. Every day, building up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost, Jude says. I'm so excited about your new walk with Christ. And I'm so excited about you hearing the Word and walking in the Word. There is more. If you have not been this way before, I love you with the love of the Lord. This is Pastor Trice, and I'm excited about your growth. I'm excited about where you're going, and I'm excited about the promises and the blessing that God has promised you. I look to see you soon. God bless you.